Frank Larry Matthews. What's up everybody? It's your girl B Octavia and I am back with another video. Now before I get into the video, let me introduce myself if you do not know me. My name is B Octavia. I am from Washington DC and I am an entrepreneur getting my entrepreneurship on with my cosmetic and skincare business called crush on you beauty and also I have a clothing line that is my baby called be the brand so make sure that you hit the links in the description to go over there and check everything out getting right into the video I was gonna go back to Detroit with it but I decided to make a stop in New York, okay? And we are going to talk about Frank Matthews. Now, I remember seeing a documentary on him, on his life, when I was a teenager. All this time, I always remembered that a drug kingpin disappeared. And I remember not too long ago, I checked up on it, and he still is missing so i decided to talk about him and talk about his disappearance and what i believe happened but first just like any video we gotta do some background on frank larry matthews born in durham north carolina february 13th 1944 frank larry matthews is a american cocaine and heroin trafficker who sold his product throughout the East Coast from 1965 to 1972. He was known to operate in over 20 states, supplying dealers throughout every region of the country. His mother passed away when he was very young, leaving his aunt to take care of him. Frank dropped out in the seventh grade, which grew tensions at home as his aunt's husband was a police lieutenant. By the time he was 14, he was the leader of a small neighborhood gang who would go out committing petty crimes like around the time they would sneak onto farms and steal stuff, stuff like that. His first arrest and conviction was in 1960 and it stemmed from a farmer confronting him about stealing from his farm. The farmer got assaulted with a brick by Frank Matthews. He served a year for theft and assault. He moved from North Carolina to Philly after his arrest. In Philly, he made connections as a numbers writer. And those connections he would later use in the drug business. Two years after his release, he was arrested in 1963. But he avoided conviction by agreeing to leave the state of Philly. It's unclear what the charge was for that, but from Philly, he moved to New York. He had a number of professional hats in New York. He became a barber. He continued collecting numbers. He became a debt collector and also an enforcer. And this was all before he built his criminal enterprise. In 1965, he got tired of collecting numbers and doing what he was doing, the various things, for a couple years. From that point in 1965, he made his transition into the drug trade. Knowing that the Italian was the main supplier of heroin at the time, and the Italian got it from the French connections, okay? Frank attempted to partner with the Gambino family and also he attempted to partner with the Bonanno family. These families controlled organized crime in New York City since the 1930s and it was from the 1930s all the way up until that point in the 1960s. Unfortunately for Frank Matthews, both organizations declined his request. However, they would soon regret that. Even though Frank was done with the numbers game, he never cut off his connections that he made during that time. And keeping those connections paid off in the long run for what he was doing in the drug trade. From his connections was a very well-known Harlem numbers king, 
if you will. And from him, he patched Frank through to a Cuban Mafia godfather named Rolando Gonzalez Nunes. And by a stroke of luck, before Mr. Nunes fled the country because an indictment was coming down on him, Nunez sold Matthews his first kilo of cocaine for $20,000 with a promise to supply more in the future. Nunez made good on his word. He started sending large sums of coke and heroin from South America. Within a year of doing business with Nunez, Frank Matthews became one of the major players in the New York drug trade. Unfortunately, as the business grew, Matthews started to use cocaine and became dependent on it. I told y'all about Frank Matthews' connection to the French. Well, that connection that he had made him the only non-mafia and African-American to have that type of connection. Now that's a big deal, and that made him a major player in the drug trade. Within a year of him doing business with the Cuban Mafia, his godfather, his business was allegedly pulling in around $10 million within that first year. And that $10 million then, in the 1960s, would be 80 or 90 maybe even more, million now. Throughout the years of him having various business ventures of being a barber, cutting hair, collecting numbers, being a enforcer, a debt collector, whatever you want to call it, right? He married a woman named Barbara Hinton and they had three kids together. As his drug business skyrocketed, he told people that he was in the real estate business and that really made them not question anything. They lived a very low profile lifestyle, living in a apartment in Flatbush before moving to a very affluent Italian neighborhood into a very nice house. Him making this move to this very affluent, heavily populated Italian neighborhood was a bold and crazy move to a lot of people, even me, because he has a certain grievance or probably holding a grudge against them for rejecting him. They as a family didn't take many pictures and Frank himself didn't take many. Frank Matthews always remembered his community that he grew up in, in Durham, North Carolina. He took care of them and they embraced him and often celebrated his arrival. Now let's get into his partners in crime. In business, Frank teamed up with Major Coxon and Tommy Farrington, who came up with Frank in North Carolina. John Pop Darby, who was his trusted lieutenant, and Tyrone, Mr. Millionaire Palmer. Within talking about his partners in crime, we cannot leave out who his enemies were. With having certain connections in Philly, that came with gaining a few enemies too. The Philly Black Mafia didn't like Frank. They usually extorted dealers who tried setting up shop in certain areas of Philly. The Philly Black Mafia couldn't touch Frank and for that reason, they took it out on his workers and his partners in crime. Tyrone Mr. Millionaire was the first of Frank's partners to be targeted. He and a few other associates of Frank went out to a club called the Club Harlem on Easter Sunday. Philly Black Mafia members killed him along with three girls and one of his security guards or however that those numbers went. I seen a few things that said different that said one girl and three bodyguards but they killed about five people. 20 people were also wounded in this shooting. The Black Mafia didn't stop there. Um, they finished off the rest of Frank's Philly crew, including murdering Major Coxon. Frank left Philly after Tyrone's murder in 1972 and before the murder of Major Coxon. Frank also became rivals with the Italians. They began to threaten Frank and he responded with threats of violence. 
the Italians wanted him dead, but him having a house in their neighborhood showed them he didn't care. After his exit from Philly, he went back to New York. He frequented various places like Las Vegas. The DEA began tracking Frank and his associates in New York and followed them throughout their various trips taking notes of where they went how many times they went a week or a month and how he would spend his day during the first week of january 1973 frank matthews arrived one morning and was indicted that day by local vegas dea agents his bail was five million dollars the highest bail ever at that time during his interview with the dea people Frank allegedly only spoke about the Italians because he wanted them to focus on something else and somebody else. The CIA actually helped Frank out by telling the DEA that they could not mention, include, reference the French connection at all. This hurt the prosecution and the case that they were trying to build at the time. The French connection was a huge part of it. So this is the start of the end. While in the county jail in Vegas, Frank told his associates that he got locked up with that once he post bail, he was leaving for good. Shortly after saying this, he was extradited back to New York City. Mr. Matthews' bail was $325,000. And this money was raised and posted by his fellow family and friends in Durham, North Carolina from all of the support that he showed them they wanted to show it back and they didn't want him to spend his own money before his release on bond Frank asked the judge was he looking at a life sentence and the judge responded yes this was information that the DEA did not want Frank to know Frank Matthews was 29 years old when he was last seen he was said to have picked up his 23-year-old mistress. He went to the bank and emptied out his safety deposit box, which allegedly contained up to $15 million, and completely went ghost. Now, some people did report seeing him speeding in Brooklyn through a red light. This sighting was backed up by a police officer who gave chase to Frank after he saw him speeding, but shortly after the chase began, the police lost sight of Frank's car. And that was the last time that he was seen. Now, in the next part, we will get into his disappearance. We will talk about the different theories and what seems to be more likely to have happened. But this can go a number of ways. But where I will leave part one is I want to say what I took away from Frank Matthews as a street legend, as a man. I think that anybody who wants to find inspiration in this you got to find it in the right way and what i find inspirational is that frank matthews before building this huge narcotic empire he started from somewhere and he started by doing various things by being a barber by collecting numbers by helping other people collect debts that have gangs and have control and power and money. I think that in having various business ventures, you build an ethic that makes you very unstoppable very quickly. You become a force to be reckoned with very fast. Now, I think that anybody who says, oh, what can we learn? We can learn how to make a legal business just as successful as a drug business, if not more. But we have to believe that that's possible because it's literally no longevity in the narcotics business. You end up a number of ways. You end up dead at a very young age or in prison for the rest of your life from a very young age, or you end up missing
And maybe it was on your terms. But what if you went missing on your own terms and then met your demise and nobody knew about it? So in part two, we will get into the possibilities, the theories, what we do know, what makes sense, and the conclusions that we come to. It's your girl, B. Octavia. Thank you for watching this video, and stay tuned for part two.